Um, we've been teaching about faith since the beginning of the year. Uh, one of the things we've been teaching about faith is how to grow in faith. Does anybody think that's important? Yes. A bunch of you do. Okay. Well, it is important. And it is important if you want to please God because Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, what? It's impossible to please God. That he comes to God and must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that every so often seek him. Every Sunday seek him. When, when you feel like it, seeking him. Diligent. Now, in order to know that if you're diligent, this is what diligent means. It means you're searching God out constantly. You're craving Him. Do you ever have a craving for some good food? I mean, every time I go to Maryland, I mean, I'm, I want crab cakes and crab meat somehow. Um, demand and worship. And almost like you're addicted to Jesus. I gave up my addiction to drugs 35 years ago, but I didn't stop being addicted. I was, I'm now I'm addicted to Jesus. Anyway, are you diligent in your faith? It's important to be. One thing I can see about Family Worship Center is this, that uh, people that press into the things of God grow fast here. And uh, probably faster than anywhere I've ever seen when they press in. I've seen people come in that have had um, been in church for a while, but they like didn't grow. And then they come in here and they're getting a word, and they're pressing in, and they're doing, they're coming to the events we have, and they're pressing in, and they're growing in their faith. It's important to never stop growing. So number one, what we've been doing is growing in our faith. Number two, we're living our lives by faith. And uh, Bible says three times in the New Testament it says the just shall live by what? By, by, by their faith. So it's a lifetime lifestyle of living for the Lord is living in faith. Um, our whole life growing and living by faith in God. And when I was thinking of that, I was thinking about all the people that I started off with going to church with back in 1985 and 1986 that um, when I started going to church, church was packed. There was, there was 300 people going to the church I was going to. And um, a lot of them were my age. I was in my young 20s. And, uh, and Dan Smucker, my father in the faith, was one of the uh, people that, he was the person that started that church, first pastor. And I remember when I met him, how hungry for God he was. I mean, he was hungering and thirsting after God. And, um, and Pastor Mike and Pastor Debbie Baker, my pastors, were the worship leaders back then, and they were hungry for God. And I think about all these years later, when you see Pastor Mike or when you see Dan or when you see uh, Pastor Debbie, do you, do you see a hunger in them? It's, he, Dan is just as hungry now as he was back then to know God. And when you can locate somebody by the first conversations you have with them. You know what I mean? When you talk to Pastor Mike or you talk to Dan or talk to somebody, when they're, they're all about everything God. And they're just hungry for it. It's like they can't get enough. They're addicted to Jesus. So that's what I want to be, addicted to Jesus too. So number two was to live your life by faith. And then number three was to share our faith. Is that important? Yes, yes. How important do you think it is? Very important for a Christian who lives by faith and grows by faith and shares faith. Then how come only 20% of the church does it? Wow. 20%. Say this with me. I believe the word of God. It's living and powerful in me. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. I can be what it says I can be. Today, I'm a believer and I'm a receiver. I do believe I will receive from the God's Word today. So what I'm teaching today is, I've taught this many, many times throughout the years, and always teaching it a little bit different. 
so that we can really get it. You know, sometimes you got to hear things over and over and over again, and this is one of them. This was one of the first revelations in the Word of God I've ever got. And, and that was th like 35 years ago, and this is one of the easiest things to slip from a Christian person's life, even if you hear it a lot. And Hebrews 2.1 says, that's why we must hold fast more firmly in the truths we have heard so they won't slip away. And like I said, you can locate somebody five minutes into a conversation. You can see what they're full of. It'll come out of them. If they're full of the things of God, that'll come out of them. Whatever they're full of, it'll come out. And I'll just leave that one right there. <laughs> so, um, Tay and I were talking this week, and I don't think she knew I was talking about it, but we were talking about something else. We talked about uh, kind of like the first years of our marriage. Um, I worked daytime. I went to work early in the morning, and I came back at four, came home at four o'clock. I gave her the car, and then she went to work, and she worked nighttime. So when I got home, I had a nine-month-old, a 19-month-old, or 20-month-old, and like almost one, almost two, and almost three. That's what I had. So, and, and so I got home, and I had to cook them dinner. So at the time, I came home from work. I'm cooking them dinner. Uh, the boys who were the youngest, one of them got the soft baby food. One of them got the kind of chunky baby food. <laughs> And then Christina got whatever I cooked for myself, she got. And so I had to feed three kids and myself at dinner time. Because you had to, you know, give a spoon, give a spoon. And Christina could eat, but it would, you would be sitting there all night in the mess she would make. It wasn't worth it. So you helped her too, right? So as, you know, I'm tired. I was a construction worker. So I'd come home from work, I'd cook dinner, I'd start feeding. And sometimes I'd get confused and who got the plate. You know what I mean? So, and we know that babies, when you put something in babies, almost sometimes as much comes back out. You have to take that spoon and wipe it across their mouth and put it back in their mouth. They gotta keep on eating the same thing, right? Until it finally gets down, right? And you say, ooh, but all every baby's like that. Well, you have to feel sorry for Grant because if I got confused in the number, Grant's the middle child, right? So if Joey spit it out sometimes, and I think he didn't like it, sometimes if I got confused, sometimes it would go in Grant's mouth, right? And, um, and if there was a glass of milk there, I wasn't washing three dishes because I hardly ever washed dishes back then anyway. I got one glass, and I said, we, you're all taking sips out of this one cup, so we'll have to wash dishes. And my gosh, sometimes there was more food in the cup. You know, how disgusting is that? But being a young 22-year-old, you know, father of three, that I had to do it. I had to do it. And I think God's like that sometimes. I think he's got to feed us things again and again yeah. until we finally get it. You know what I mean? Until we finally swallow it and it becomes part of us. So um, look at your neighbor and say, you're eating it today whether you like it or not. <laughs> Okay. Turn with me to the book of James, chapter 3. And Lord, as we open up your word today, we thank you for illumination, revelation in, into your word. We thank you that your word becomes alive to us. We thank you that it goes down deep in our spirits, Father God, and as it comes back out, it produces your life and our life. We thank you for it. Thank you for giving me utterance in the word of God. We thank you for giving everybody who hears this ears to hear, hearts to receive, minds that understand, and wills to adjust and change to conform to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go to James chapter 3. Let's start at verse 2. Are you there? Yes. It says we all make mistakes. Don't look at some. Don't look at your husband or wife. A person who never says anything wrong would be perfect. Someone like that would be able to control their whole body too. We put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us. With these bits, we can control their whole body 
It's the same with ships. A ship is very big and is pushed by strong winds, but a very small rudder controls that big ship. And if I was underlining anything in my Bible, this next sentence would be where I would underline. And the one who controls the rudder decides where the ship will go. It goes where he wants it to go. It's the same with your tongue. Okay, let me say that again before we go on. And the one who controls the rudder decides where the ship will go. It goes where he wants it to go. It's the same with your tongue. It is a small part of the body, but it can boast about doing great things. A big forest fire can be started with only a little flame. The tongue is like a fire. It is a world of evil among the parts of the body. It spreads its evil through the whole body. It starts a fire that influences all of life. It gets this fire from hell. Humans have control over every kind of wild animal, bird, <coughs> reptile, and fish. And they have control with all these things, but no one can control the tongue. No man can control the tongue, but the Holy Spirit can. It's a world of evil, full of deadly poison. We use our tongues to praise our Lord and Father. But then we turn right around and curse people who created God's likeness. These praises and curses come from the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, this should not happen. Now look at me. We're going to look and see why God thinks that this is so important today. First question, and there's a very important question I want to ask you, is are you speaking life or are you speaking death with your words over yourself and over other people too? Because your life is a product of your thoughts first. This is the order it goes in. Thoughts words, and then actions. That's what your life, right now, where you're at in life is a product of your thoughts, words, and actions. And that's the format that happens. Uh, Jeremy, can you bring up the scripture, please? It says this. It's, everybody's familiar with this scripture, but I just, you should commit this with the memory. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. And an easy read verse it says this. I like this better. It says, the tongue can speak words that bring life or death. And those who love to talk must be ready to accept what it brings. In other words, your life is a product of your words. Is it going to bring forth life? Is it going to bring forth death? We just read in James the mark of maturity in a Christian and a grown person and a grown Christian person is uh, right under your nose. And it's your mouth. And James said, in many ways we offend. And what is the biggest cause of offense in people? It's what you say to them. Maybe. If you think about it, most of the time you get offended with somebody, it's what they've said to you, what they've said about you, or something like that. And that's where the biggest reason of offense. So I'm going to answer it in the word as we speak to people. Three areas. The first area, Jeremy put it, is this. How you relate and respond to people. And I think it's pretty funny. There's a horse with a bit in his mouth. That's not Mr. Ed either. So. Um, and I think it's funny how James related our mouth and words and tongue to putting a bridle in a horse's mouth to train it. Now how long does it take to train a horse? I don't know, I guess every horse is different. You know, the horses, some horses are so stubborn they never can be trained. You know that, right? You know, some, some horses train easy, but if it's, if it's, if ever try to put a saddle on a horse that hasn't been saddled many times? Ever try to ride a horse that hasn't been ridden many times? And besides me, I've been bucked off of many, I'm telling you, because they were untrained. And I tell you what, we had a friend whose father had a racehorse, and I would go with him um, to feed his horse and take care of him. And every time, and the, and the barn was full of horses on both sides, and there was a walking, and you would walk through, and horses will bite you when you turn your back to them. If they can get you your butt or back, they'll bite you. That's not too unlike us. Somebody who has an untrained tongue will hurt people with it. And um, people do the same things with their words every day. Even people that should know better, they bite, 
They were stubborn to repent, and they hurt people. And here's a big question. Uh, I always ask you questions. Here's a big question. Can God trust you? It's important to you that he can. Can he trust you? People say, and I'll tell you why, because people say things in anger a lot that they don't really mean. They might mean them at the time, but they don't really mean it. The I hate you's, the whatever ugly thing they say to you when they're, when they're upset, when they're dealing with their emotions, they'll say something that they wish they could take back, but once it's out, you can't take it back. And it does something to a person. It just doesn't sit there and go in one ear and out the other. And uh, even if you say you're sorry, that doesn't make the words that you said to that person go away. Because being in this position as a pastor, I've seen people that have been damaged their whole lives by the words others have spoken over them, especially if those other people are people in authority. Mothers and fathers, um, teachers even. Uh, can you bring up the next scripture, Jeremy? Listen to this scripture. It's Proverbs 26, 22. And it says, The words of a talebearer as, are as wounds, and they go down to the innermost part of the belly. Now, we know that word talebearer means what? Gossip, right? Somebody who carries tales. Um, and I hope at this point in your walk with God that you don't gossip. But uh, I want you to know that if you do give yourself to gossip, it's just like giving somebody poison to drink and then you poisoning yourself at the same time. You poison other people. But that word, talebearer, is the word, Hebrew word, nergain, and it means to use hard and wounding words. And I want you to notice, it doesn't just go in one ear and out the other, does it? Where does the Bible say it goes? To the innermost parts of the belly. To it affects you and your spirit. And some people... Um, have been affected in their spirit by the words others have spoken over them and it has been there all their life. And um, I wasn't going to go here, but I'm going to go here anyway, just a little bit. My father was, a, I talk about my dad a lot, I loved him, I loved mom and dad, they're not with me anymore. So maybe they'll hear in heaven, who knows. But um, my father was abused when he was a child. He was, uh, verbally and physically abused. And, um, and because of that, he was a driven man. And uh, he always felt like nothing he did was good enough. And I don't know if that's what he was told, but he felt like that. So as soon as he turned 18, he, he enlisted to go over to Germany and fight in the war. And he got back, he took the first job he could find when he got back, and that was at Bethlehem Steel, it was wartime, right after the war, Steel was a big business, and he started, the only, he, just having a high school education, the only thing he could do was shovel lime all day. And you know, lime will eat up your clothes, it'll eat up your skin, it'll eat up anything it touches. So even in those big Coke ovens where it might have been 120 degrees, he was working fully dressed with clothes on, Shoveling, that's what he did all day. But my father was driven. He was driven by the, the fact that people told him that he couldn't, or that he would never be, or they just was abused. So he had something to prove to himself, and I guess to them too. So my father, without an education, I mean, he took uh, some college courses, but uh, he ended up um, at Bethlehem Steel retiring as chief metallurgist scientist without an education. All these people had master's degrees that came in there and he passed them and bypassed him through the way he dealt with people and through the way he was good with numbers and, and good with uh, scientific things. Metal, he was a metallurgist. He tested metal to see how the hardness and you know, it's important when you put metal on a bridge or a boat that it doesn't bend, right? So that's what he did. And he made it from the bottom to the top in just a few years because he was driven. Now, I told you that to tell you this. I grew up under that. 
And, um, and I see a lot of my father as I've gotten older and me that um, I, you never could tell me that I can't do anything. I don't know if it was rebellion or that you just watch. Tell me I can't do something. I'm going to do it. But, um, and I'm going to do it the best I can. So, uh, but my father was one who, I don't know, it was because of the way he grew up, he never affirmed his children. It would have been nice to have been called, hey, you're good looking, you're smart, you're something. It would be nice to have something. You know what I mean? Have a word. But he did, although he didn't really say negative things to you, he didn't say positive things to you either. And I found myself, and I wanted to change that, I found myself as I was a young father growing up and stuff like that, I would always tell my kids what they did wrong, but I would never tell them enough what they did right. Okay, I'm being transparent before you, okay? I would never tell them enough what they did right. And then when the Lord brought me into the ministry, and I've been in the ministry for a long time, maybe just your pastor for 17 years, but, but I, I realized I don't give enough, I guess in the world we would call them attaboys. I don't give enough affirmation of how I feel about somebody or how good of a job I think they do or, or what. I just, I found myself not doing that enough. And I said, man, I want to change. I want that to be changed in my life. I want people to know how I really feel instead of holding those feelings in. I want to build with my words instead of just do nothing or even tear down, because I think that's really important. Who has ever started a fire outside? Okay, uh, campfire or burning leaves or anything like that? And who's done it with like a match or something, a little match? And done it? What happens to that match? Can you go back in your fire? Because remember what James just said, he said, a little, a big fire is caused by a little kindling or a little match. Who can go back and find the match that you lit that big fire with? What happens to it? It just burns up. And you'll never be able to get it back again. And then James is saying that's the way we should be, that's the way most people are with their words. They wish they could get their words that they've spoken back, and they can't. Um, if, you, if you've never went back to repent to a person that you've blown off with your words, whether you were right or wrong, you're wrong. Let me just put it plain. If you've used your words to hurt somebody, cut somebody down, whether you feel justified in it, whether you feel right in it, whether you're, you were right or wrong, you're wrong. And the thing is that um, it's either because you've been hurt or mad, you don't do those things just to do them, or you're judging the other person in your heart. But the Bible says this, it says a kind answer, and that's in Proverbs 15, it says a kind, soft answer soothes angry feelings, but harsh words stir them up. So you got to ask yourself a question today, are you a soother or a stirrer? What would other people say about you? Do you like to soothe situations down or do you stir them up with your words? So what are we supposed to do? Here's what we're supposed to do. Colossians chapter 4 verse 6 says this, it says, let your words always be with grace. Grace is a gift. When you speak, are you gifting people with your words? Let your spit words always be with a gift, seasoned with salt. What does salt do? That's seasoned. Adds flavor to it, doesn't it? And it preserves something, doesn't it? So that you might now know how to speak to every man. Like I said, complimenting had been a big issue with me. And it's maybe it's because I wasn't complimented. I don't know. And um and, and because I wasn't complimented, when people, and here's another thing, just being honest with you, maybe you can relate to this, maybe you can't, maybe I'm preaching to myself, maybe I'll watch the tape later when I get ministered to, I don't know. So, 
I have a problem, a real problem, receiving compliments to this day because I never got them in my life. And then when somebody gives it to me, I don't, I don't usually believe them. I believe it's under a false, sometimes I believe it's flattery. Just, and I just, and that's not right either. You can be so much one way or you can be so much the other way. God wants us to have a balance in your life. When people give you a genuine compliment, you say what? Thank you. Thank you. And agree with it. Yeah, I am the best looking person you know. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's one. If God can trust, now here's the thing. If God can trust you here, if he can trust this part, how you deal with and relate, respond to people, He'll open up a whole brand new level of authority in your life that you never knew even existed. And you'll be able to walk it out in this power. Okay. Number two, Jeremy, please bring us up. Uh, number two, number one was, what was one number one again? Was how you relate, respond to people. Number two is this every gift and ministry gift is released and operated by words. You've got to remember that. That's why you need God to be able to trust your words so much. Amen. The power to do good and bring forth things in your life as well as other people's lives to be used by God in a mighty way is all released through words. And if God can trust your words, you will operate in a higher level of authority. Here's a scripture, and you know this scripture, Isaiah 55. It says, So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Now, ask yourself a question. Do my words return void? Don't shake, shake your head yes or no, because the answer is no. Jesus said your words either bring forth good things or your words bring forth evil things and that will give an account for the idle words that you speak. In other words, you can't, let me put it where the rubber hits the road. And um, you can't talk sickness and expect help to come. You just can't. You can't. If all the time people are talking sickness, and we're not denying that something's going on with your body, right? We're, we're not denying it because Christian science would say if your arm was broken, my arm's not broken, my arm's not broken. But God would say when you, if your arm was broken, by his stripes I'm healed. Okay? There's a big difference in denying something, the reality of something, and then to speak God's will into it. That's why a lot of people don't receive from God. That's just crazy that, that something that is, if you say it's not. You can't talk sickness and disease. How much does, he says a sweet, a, a fountain can't put out salt water and fresh water at the same time. It just can't. Right? That's what he said in that word. Or bitter and sweet at the same time. He, and it's, when you do, when you, when you talk like that, and that is the vocabulary of your life, saying one thing and wanting the other thing, you're calling the cat, I mean dog, and you get the cat, right? So here's what. How much does a double-minded man receive? How about a double-tongued person? Same thing as being, like I said, it comes thoughts, words, actions. They receive nothing from God. If you've been struggling in an area of sickness and disease, or let me put it like this. Um, you can't talk poverty all the time out of your mouth and expect wealth. What are you calling for? If you want the dog, you call for the dog, not the cat. You call for what you want. As a matter of fact, God was so purposeful of this, and back in the book of um, Genesis, he had a man named Abraham. Abram. It means tall man or whatever. That's all it means. Tall father. And he promised this man a child. And this man was going years and years and years without getting a child. And every time God approached him, he said, what will you give me? 
Because everything I want is a child, and I can't give it. He had to change the man's mouth in order to change the outcome of his life. So the only way he could do this was change his name from Abram to Abraham, because Abraham means father of a multitude, and he demanded that everybody call him father of a multitude when he didn't have any kids. When he did that, it took him less than a year to get his answer. He waited 25 years. And then less than one year, he got his answer. As a matter of fact, he tried to make it happen himself when he was Abram. He went into Sarah's handmaid. And she said, go give me a child by my handmaid. And he didn't say, I rebuke you, woman. He said, sound like a good idea to me. I go in. And um, he came out with an Ishmael. And from that time of disobedience, because he wouldn't do what God said, it was 13 years before he heard the voice of God again. Sometimes we need to, our mouth stops us. You know, your own mouth can pollute your brain. You know that. It really can. So ask yourself, do my words return void? And the answer is no. You were created just like God, in the image of God, given the authority that he gave you back in Genesis chapter 1, and he wants those words. The first words man ever heard were the blessing, and he wants us to use those same words that he spoke over us to bless people. Tammy and I saw the movie Breakthrough this week, right? It was, a, it was a good movie. I think we're going to play it here and, and invite your families and just come to see this movie. So don't watch it till you watch it here. So um, I promise popcorn for you. So anyway. Anyway, we saw this movie break for it through. And it's about a boy who falls through the ice. And with his two other friends, his two other friends grab one and they're rescued. And he sinks to the bottom. And he's down there for 20 minutes before a fireman hears a voice that says, go the other way. He hits him with a cane, drags him up. So he's, he's not going to live. Nobody thinks he's going to live. And if he does manage to live the first 24 hours, he's going to have brain damage. He's going to be a vegetable the rest of his life. right? So that's what everybody's saying over him. The doctors, the nurses, they fly him to a big hospital. He got a mama who's a Christian praying mama, though. So here's the deal. She would not let anybody speak negative words over her son. She wouldn't let a doctor. She wouldn't let the nurses. She wouldn't let family. She wouldn't let friends. She wouldn't let anybody speak death on that person, on that young man, so that young man could hear it. Even when she went out of the room and they told her, well, this is what's happening. This is what we expect to happen. She said, I'm not having it. She yelled at him. She told him, how dare you speak that in front of my child? He can hear you. And we're meant to be receivers of words, right? So, and, and that was a movie. That was a great thing. But that's what that woman did. She didn't get off her confession. She didn't get off her faith. And she would not let the wrong words be spoken over that child. We know people, not in movies, that have went through the same challenge and have beaten cancers. Beaten cancers. We, there, when we first started the church, we had a little girl that went to this church and she had cancer in her face and nasal passages and it was spreading and everything. And she was at MCV and, uh, and, and her parents, would all they would do, they were, they were new Christians at the time, and they got a hold of this truth. And they, all they would do is play worship music and the word of God in her room, always going forth into her and, and she was getting chemo, they were giving her treatments, and they were saying she wasn't going to make it, that she'd only go six months. And every time somebody, they wouldn't let family in the room, if family, anybody that was going to speak contrary to what they believed wasn't coming in the room. And doctors, they met with them outside the room. This is how we're going to do your treatment. And they, and they, would, they held fast to their confession of faith without wavering. And the little girl was in the hospital for a month and got out completely cured and completely healed because they wouldn't be moved off of their words. You cannot be double-minded and expect to receive from God. You can't talk back in poverty and 
expect wealth. You can't talk sickness and disease and expect health. It doesn't work that way. And if as long as you're spitting out both sides of your mouth, you're going to be in limbo because a double-minded man receives nothing from the Lord. Nothing. I'm glad you're all excited about that. Yes, sir. And breakthroughs based on a true story. And we also know people uh, just like that, seeing it work for them. And the thing is, whose report are you going to believe? When the rubber hits the road and becomes real life to you, and sometimes life and death situation, what are you going to let out of your mouth? Because the Bible says, King James Version says, death and life. It mentions death first. You know why? Because that's what most people come out of their mouth. And you better be ready to accept what it brings. You're going to eat the fruit. So what do you want? And this is one place from the first thing I've ever learned as a Christian was this. And I tell you, it's the fastest thing to slip in anybody, any one of us. It's the first thing really to slip. So back to what we read in James 3, 2, verse 2. It says, in, all, in many ways we make mistakes. A person who never says anything wrong would be perfect. That means mature. That doesn't mean you're perfect, right? Someone like that would be able to control the whole body, too. Somebody who can control this controls the whole body. You get this, right? Yes. So are you saving yourself from trouble? Or are you inviting it? And here's how you can tell. Jeremy, bring the next slide up, please. Proverbs 10, 19. A person who talks too much gets into trouble. A wise person learns when to be quiet and listen. Who are you? Next one, Jeremy. So let finish, people finish speaking before you try to answer them. Guilty. Yeah, 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 me too. Yeah. Do you know why you're guilty? Because they, they trigger something in you. You get a thought, you get an idea, and you want to get it out there before you lose it or forget it. But the thing is, it's not only is it rude, but and not only do I, gosh, I've been working on that. But people like to talk to somebody who's a good listener. My wife's a good listener. People love to talk to her. You know why? Because she'll, she'll listen and then, and, and then she'll get to a place where she won't want to talk about herself. She'll just ask you questions. When everybody needs counsel, I said, always say, talk to Tammy, because I'm not going to let you finish. I'm going to tell you what to do before you get it out of your mouth, right? Yeah. But the Word of God says this. Well, sometimes they just need to get it out. Sometimes it's, it's detrimental to you until you let it out, and then all of a sudden, hey, it's not that big of a deal. Because somebody was willing to listen to you. Okay. Number three, Jeremy, please. Words from good people are like pure silver. You know what they did? Silver is about, was, even back then, was very, very valuable. Pure silver. You know what they do to make pure silver? They burned all the impurities uh, out of it. They put it through a fire, and they burned the impurities out of it until it's not, but the impurities that rises to the top, and you, you, got yourself, um, you got yourself pure silver. It's, it's the words that you're speaking beneficial and valuable to other people or not. Go ahead, next one, Jeremy. It says, good people say things that help other people. Um, is your motive, now here's a good one, is your motive to set somebody straight or to help them out? Many times, our motives are to get somebody set them straight. Oh man, it's, they need, you know, they say this garbage, they need to be, somebody's got to set them straight. You never said that, have you? So, no, okay, there's, you know, you gotta forgive me for lying, just for, like, for anything else, right? Anyway, that's another thing, I won't even go there. I said, it's amazing to me how many Christians just lie all the time. It amazes me. And, and it, they don't think anything of it. And the thing is, if you ever want any power behind the words that you speak, 
Power just like Jesus to call things into being, good things into being. Power to say, be healed. You can't be a liar. You cannot be a liar and do that. Because you're, you've, you've lied so much that you're convinced yourself. Yeah. And one of the things I can tell about a spirit of God, I don't know why, but it's a warning. For no reason. But I can tell by the spirit of God two things almost every time. And I just, to innocent bystander, I'm just, uh, 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 and God will say something to me. I can tell when somebody's lying, and I can tell when somebody's words aren't their own. Like they've heard words from other people, and they've taken their thoughts and ideas and made it their own. I've seen that many times. And a lot of times, I've, I've been with Tammy, and just said, I've said to her, that didn't come from her. That's not even her thought. Somebody else said that, she got on to it. And, and that's not healthy either. So, all right, I think this is going real good. Next one, Jeremy, please. <laughs> Peter, 1 Peter 3.10 says, and then if you want a happy life, happy in a good life, keep control of your tongue and guard your lips from telling lies. If you want a good life and a, and a happy life, a blessed life, how do you do it? You do it with your mouth. You do it by keeping your mouth from telling lies and saying things that aren't true. Now I looked it up, and here's some important subjects in your Bible. Angels. How many people think angels is a kind of important biblical subject? Mm -hmm. Mentioned 92 times in your Bible. Right? Healing and health. How many people think healing and health is important yes. in, in your Bible and it's important to be in your life, right? 146 times mentioned. Heaven. Final destination. These are the voyages of the... Anyway... So how many people think heaven is an important thing, subject? 550 times. Hell. Mm, only mentioned 54 times. Wasn't created for us. Not even a lot we can know about it. A lot we can, but anyway. But either the word speak, talk, is mentioned 1,878 times. More three times, four times more than heaven, more than angels, more than healing and health. Your tongue is mentioned eight over eighteen hundred times in the Bible. So you think uh, God thinks that's an important subject for us to learn? Yes. I think so. So number three, Jeremy, can you bring it up, please? And the last is charting the course uh, with your life and. Um, how the first one was be how you relate to people. The second would be uh, the power of God in your life. The third one would be how you, and I didn't bring it. So, but I do have a Bible. So open with me to 1 uh, Samuel chapter 17. This would be good for everybody to read today. 1 Samuel chapter 17. I had it. I printed it off at home this morning and I left it right where I want to print it. Would you go with my desk and go up this is for I can make this say anything from what I'm seeing today. There's my words. This is the story of David and Goliath. You know this, right? So I'm just going to have you get to highlights of it. Verse 3. It says, The Philistines stood on the side of the mountain, and Israel stood on the other side of the mountain. And a valley was between them, and a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. And he wore a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had a bronze armor on, his legs and bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of the spear was like a weaver's bean, and an iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. And then he stood on the side and cried out to the armies of Israel and said, Why have you come to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and your servants? And Saul, choose a man 
for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we'll be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine says, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of an Ephraim right of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and had eight sons. And this man was old, advanced in years, in the days of Saul. And the three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to battle, and the names of his three sons that went to battle were Eliab, the firstborn next to him, was Abinadab, and the third was Shah. And David was the youngest, the three oldest followed Saul. And David occasionally went to return from Saul to feed his brothers had to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistines drew near and presented themselves 40 days. And Jesse said to David, Take now for your brothers an epath and dry grain and these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand and see how your brothers fare and bring back the news. And Saul and they all were in the valley, were in the valley of Eli fighting the Philistines. So David rose up early in the morning left the sheep with the keeper and took the things and went to Jesse, commanded him, and he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight, shouting for the battle. And Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in a battle array, army against army. And David left the supplies in the hand of the keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, his brothers, who was a champion of the Philistines of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him with the king will enrich him with great riches, will give him his daughter, and give his father's house exemption from taxes. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? See, he added to it. For there, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? In other words, this man had no covenant with God, and he did. And the people answered him, the matter, so shall it be done for men. Now Eliab, his older brother, heard and he spoke to the men. Eliab's anger was aroused. Why did you come down here? Why have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he turned from him to another and said the same thing, and the people answered as they did at first. Now the words which David spoke with her, and he reported them to Saul and sent them. And David said to Saul, listen to his words. He is charting the course for his own future. Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are unable to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a youth, and he's a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and then a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, and I went after it, struck it, and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by the beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant has both killed the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be just like one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. Meanwhile, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Let's go down. To verse 40, because he couldn't use Saul's armor. So he said, So he took his staff in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch and one he had when he slain his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked and saw how David was disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. Could have said probably the same thing about me. But um, so the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come with me with a stick? And the Philistine and cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, 
You come at me with a sword and with a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, who you defy. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth might know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give it into our hands. Now, you know the rest of the story. What was that guy's name? Paul Harvey? Yes. You say that? You know the rest of the story. But what you, what you, I need you to realize when everybody else was saying what, with their mouth what God couldn't do, when everybody was hiding in a hole, when even the king was saying, here, you know, go ahead, you know, kind of thing. And when somebody was challenging uh, David, and I mean, it must have been intimidating to go be a kid, probably, you know, probably, you know, teenager, maybe five foot eight or something like that, because they weren't as tall as we are nowadays, and, <clears throat> and go up there and see a 10 foot giant, and see a man carrying a shield, and seeing that you probably couldn't even lift his weapons, okay? And then, and then go up against him and say what the Lord has done for you already. Rehearse it. Rehearse it before everybody. Keep your eye on the reward. See, how many times did he ask about the reward? Three times. He asked about the reward. He was thinking, you know what? No taxes. Make me a rich man, never have to pay taxes again. Give me the king's daughter. What's she look like? <laughs> kind of thing, you know what I mean? I mean, maybe fought a little harder if she was pretty. You know what I mean? <laughs> anyway. But he was, what did he say? He said what the Lord had already done. Yes. He had his eyes on the prize. And then when it came down to where the rubber met the road, all he said was what I am going to do and how God is going to back me up. He didn't use any of his own words. He took the enemy's own sword and cut his head off with it. Where's your mouth located? Is it in your stomach somewhere or on your arm someplace? He shut up the mouth of the enemy. That's something that we need to do. We need to not speak the enemy's words. Where the whole camp was speaking the enemy's words, David was speaking God's word. So my three questions to you before we leave today is this. Right now, self-evaluation, where are you at right now? Are you even on the right word, a road? Are you going around in circles? Are you moving but not getting anywhere in your life? Because remember, your life is a product of what your words, your thoughts conform to what your word is. You can have God thoughts like David did, where you can have your thoughts, which can go anywhere, or you can have the devil's thoughts. You notice I say this a lot. I say some people can hear the devil's voice more than they can hear God's voice. It seems like they listen to it more than they listen to God. That's unfortunate, but that's, I, I, that's an observation. So where are you at? Number two, where do you want to be? So make sure your destination for you and God's destination for you are the same. Where do you want to be in life? Where do you want to be in, in ministry? Where do you want to be as you're serving to the Lord? Where do you want to be? If you're not content where you are, what are you doing about it? The thing is, God takes everything he's already given you, every gifting, every talent, every anointing, and he makes it grow as you're serving with it. Because if you're not serving him with it, you might have it, and you're just putting it up on the shelf and nothing's being done with it. You know, with it, you have, the world's got a saying, if you don't use it, what happens? You lose it. Well, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. You can't, you can't lose them, but you might lose your timing in it. So it leads me to the third question. How do you respond to God's words to you? I'll give you the answer. Whenever God speaks to you, or whenever God asks you to do something, how do you respond to it? This is what you do. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You want me to do that? Yes, sir. You want me to give that? 
I don't want to, but I will. Yes, sir. Do you want me to do that for somebody? I don't want to, but I will. Yes, sir. Because you don't want to be in the same place. God, I mean, your future, God's got a plan for you, and it's only going to come to pass when you connect with his plan for you. That's true. You're only going to connect. It's only going to happen. It's only going to happen for you when you connect with it. And you tell the Lord, yes, I will. Enclose your Bibles.